doctors. We see them as highly educated, cool in a crisis, and above all, dedicated to their patients. We trust that they know how to save us from the maladies we suffer. But what we don't see is that physicians also suffer, and they die by suicide more often than the general public. In fact, three to four hundred physicians take their own lives each year. And that's simply a staggering loss when you think about it. That's equal to perhaps two or three medical school classes. The main cause of suicide is untreated depression. And yet we would think doctors would be the first ones to get help for such a common and treatable health problem. Sadly, the problem may lie in their reluctance to seek help from one another. You hear stories often of physicians who commit suicide and the community around them is taken by surprise because they haven't known that there was anything wrong at all. This program explores the hidden and perplexing phenomenon of physician depression and suicide. From the crucible of medical school, through the challenges faced by practicing physicians, to the potential of treatment to save lives and improve medical care. These stories shed light on the personal fears, professional policies, and cultural mores that keep physicians struggling in silence. Back on 4th of July of 1989, I was coming back from a a week at the uh, Colorado River driving my motor home and I heard a loud pop and my motor home exploded. Mike was flown to the nearest burn center in Southern California. He had sustained life-threatening third-degree burns on 95% of his body. Fortunately for him, one of the nation's top burn surgeons, Dr. John Hansbro, was there to meet him. Dr. Hansbro met us at the roof and asked me if I wanted him to do everything possible to uh, save my life, and I responded to him. And that's when they started in with my burn care. The care of burn patients has progressed. It's become more of a surgical art. Patients are going back and forth to surgery. They're very, very sick. A major burn patient takes a lot of staff members taking care of them. It's nonstop. Dr. Hansbro's wife, Wendy, was the nurse manager on the burn unit. She saw firsthand how the burn team learned to put personal feelings aside to make emergency decisions. John had to make some really hard decisions sometimes. The decision maybe to, to cause the patient more pain or, or sometimes decisions to do amputations. The odds were definitely against me. I had total you know, renal failure, all my internal organs shut down, I was on dialysis. I went in the hospital weighing 200 pounds and I got down to 70. I had about 40 surgeries went and like 1,600 pints of blood. Dr. Hansborough did, you know, all the, all the surgeries that I had, every procedure that tried and experimented and, I mean, everything worked. I mean, perfectly. Mike completed his recovery in half the time expected and amazingly was completely intact physically. He credits Dr. Hansbro with not only saving his life, but leaving him able to fully enjoy it. I remember when um, our first son was born, Jared, who is 11, and I brought him to uh, Dr. Hansbro's house and showed him Jared. I remember Wendy telling me that after we left that he actually got emotional over that, and he wasn't a real, real emotional person, so but I was just as excited to show him you know, the, our first kid as he, as he was to, you know, to see him. I kind of feel like that I was like his prize uh, accomplishment. I feel honored, you know, at, at that. Mike and Dr. Hansbro remained close over the years. And then the doctor had a crisis of his own. I had paged him, I hadn't heard from him, which was out of character for John. When he finally called me back, that he was not okay. He wouldn't tell me where he was. And so it was impossible to even find him. And, and I knew. 
and he that that was the last conversation I had with him Today, an internationally respected burn surgeon was found dead in his car in an apparent suicide. Authorities say Hansbro, 55, was parked on him. For me and my children, it of course completely changed our life. He just hit a good, picked out a good pitch and he played it out there in left field. Very good. It erased the future that I had envisioned. I mean, I planned to spend the rest of my life with John growing old. And so that dream was gone. After I had heard of um, Dr. Hensborough's death, it blew me away. This guy changed thousands of lives, you know, helped thousands of people over his career. And, and nobody knew that he was having struggles. That's, that's the sad thing about the whole thing. My wife was pregnant with a fourth baby and we Actually, uh, we just, I mean, instantly just said, you know what? We're going to name him after, uh, you know, John, John Ansboro. So what time is your game today? Seven years later, Wendy is raising their two kids and working on a Ph.D. in nursing. She has thought a lot about how this could have happened to someone as level-headed as John. And she's come to terms with the simple fact that untreated depression in anyone can be fatal. Depression is a very common disorder that over the course of the life cycle affects one in 10 men and two in 10 women. The core symptoms of depression have to do with the experience of sadness and pessimism and lowering of mood, as well as a loss of pleasure and interest in, in usual activities. And particularly worrisome is suicidal ideation and the risk for suicide that is posed by major depression. Our best estimate is that somewhere between 10 and 15 percent of people living uh, with clinical depression eventually take their own lives. Well, this is the one time I came over with that in, like, this is like really in the morning, and, um... John has a serious bout with depression that was triggered by a uh, number of factors, not least of which was the death of his mother um, from cancer, and went through a period where he took antidepressants and he got some counseling. And then he was fine for, for many years. But a period of time leading up to his death, he, he was again struggling some with the depression. Wendy knew John was struggling but he didn't share the extent of his feelings with her. And this time, he did not seek treatment. Physicians, they're like the rest of the population. They get the same disease as everybody else does. But I don't know that they necessarily always take care of themselves very well. We need to see ourselves as very strong people uh, with great resiliency. And so it's difficult for us to own, if you will, um, a mental disorder like depression or bipolar disorder. And it's that denial, which I think is related to stigma, that often leads to a delay in the treatment, sometimes with tragic consequences. Since John's death, Wendy has done research on physician depression and suicide and has been involved in workshops for physician groups. She believes a change in the professional culture is needed. Physicians, it's traditionally been taboo to discuss emotional problems amongst yourselves or your own. Those were viewed as weaknesses. It wasn't like they would say, gee, John, you know, I, I hear you got, you know, a young man in with a terrible injury. You know, how's that going? And there was, there's, those conversations, for the most part, don't happen. So they don't really have any place to... Um, discuss it or even to vent a little bit about it. Dr. Hansbrough's story illustrates the complex interplay of personal and cultural factors at work in this issue. It also shows that the impact from even one physician's death can be profound. It's a huge loss. I just, you know, thank God every day that I was in the area that I was, you know, to be at, at that hospital and with Dr. Hansbrough, because I know I would have not got the same care in that treatment that I got there. John was brilliant. He contributed a lot 
to the literature and to, to knowledge as well as to his patients. And, and it was his passion. And so when he died, they lost a physician with a passion for taking care of those patients. I've thought a lot about the culture of medical care and nursing care in the last few years. And I think that it's important for physicians to begin to recognize um, emotional needs of their patients first. And, and, and maybe in doing that, they'll become more comfortable with recognizing the emotional needs of each other. The institutional culture of medicine has to date accorded relatively low priority to physician mental health. This culture, which largely ignores the health needs of physicians themselves, begins to be instilled from their very first years of training. Traditionally, medical school has been a highly competitive environment where students made profound sacrifices to get ahead, including their own health and their relationships with one another. The University of California, San Diego School of Medicine is one of the many schools around the country trying to do it differently. Okay, why do they say your analysis shows three plus protein? While teaching medical students to care for sick and dying patients, they also teach them to care for themselves and each other. We do see the very important core value of learning to take care of oneself as being a very important principle in developing one's own professional traits in the care of and service of patients. That change in knowing that we can choose the kind of doctors that we want to be. We don't have to. To help develop a culture that supports healthy behaviors and help seeking, students have created a peer mentoring program. Because there's all kinds of options. But These student volunteers offer confidential support to other students and help them access resources provided by the school. Is there anything for MS2s, like with the boards coming up, that you'd like to see the peer mentors do? The peer mentors and their faculty advisors meet regularly to plan activities they hope will create more community among students. They discuss their own experiences of medical school in order to better assess the needs of their peers. I was struck the first time that I went to the white coat ceremony. The message was, we have accepted you, you are the cream of the crop, and just by virtue of being accepted and putting on that white coat, we believe in you. I felt like, wow, I really, you know, am now part of this. You're like joining the club. They can't get rid of me now. I own, <laughs> they can't get rid of me. Because orientation, I was like, I could still screw up and they could kick me out before I even take a class. But now I'm in. <laughs> That is the sense you get during the white coat ceremony and you're being inducted into the first year class. It is a great feeling because it's like finally the goal that you were aiming for, you've reached. It's sort of like a honeymoon period because it lasts about two weeks and then you realize, oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now I have to get through this. But then when they start hitting you with all kinds of you know information at such a fast rate, then you start going, oh my God. Oh my God, and then you start feeling overwhelmed. And that's when you start feeling like maybe you, you, you might not really be, you're not supposed to be here. Like, oh, they made a mistake in taking me. And then I'm not, you know, there have been a lot of students I've talked to who actually have that. Since orientation, I have not felt like cream of the crop, you know? Um, I felt like bottom of the barrel most of the time, you know? The very common experience of these students coming out of um, you know, many of the top colleges around the country at the absolute top of their class or they probably wouldn't have gotten into medical school. You take these people and bring them together and suddenly you create a new standard curve where a lot of those people are going to move toward the middle of the curve and be more average and they've never had experience with that. This really throws everything into question because being average feels in, to, to some of these folks as failure and the most you get is... Many students adjust to these experiences with minimal difficulty. Other students like Blanca, who have depression or anxiety disorder, or an underlying susceptibility to these, may have more trouble. As many of you know, I had to repeat fall quarter. I thought there was something deeply wrong with me, and no matter how hard I studied, I couldn't do well on exams, so what did that mean? What, what was, you know, I was going to get kicked out. A student can get very demoralized if a crisis comes up and then they fail an exam and then their overall grade for that course is in jeopardy and then what does that mean in terms of my 
academic progression. And then what's that going to mean in terms of my chances of getting the residency that I want? Maybe now I can't go into the specialty that I want. You see, it really can spiral out. And this can be overwhelming, um, as you can imagine. The anxiety caused me to have the, the problems with the exams. And then winter quarter came and organ physiology started. And I thought, OK, I'm going to just maybe take, buckle down, take a different approach, really study. And I ended up failing the respiratory exam, the first exam. So that really just, you know, blew me over and I, I got depressed. When you're going through it, you're like, well, this is a natural reaction to be really sad. But in some people, the depression, <laughs> the sadness becomes something that physiologically paralyzes you. While stress may have been a factor in the onset of Blanca's depression, it was not the sole cause. Researchers believe that a family history of depression and suicide, a predisposition to depression, and psychological factors combine to make one person more vulnerable to depression than another. Age can also be an important factor in its onset. If we take a life cycle perspective on mood disorders like depression, we now understand that depression often has its onset uh, in the first two or three decades of life. Because of the nature of depression, it would have been very hard for Blanca to complete medical school without treatment. The very experience and symptoms of depression are usually so profound because it, it's not just in the head from the neck up, like people might think about depression being feeling sad and blue, kind of an emotional experience. It's a very whole person experience. There are a lot of bodily symptoms, aches and pains, fatigue, sleep problems, usually not able to sleep as well. Energies can be horribly affected. Concentration, ability to follow through with things. I would sit there and study for eight to 10 hours a day but it didn't do me any good because I wouldn't remember what I studied for the exam. And of course I was also anxious. So that, you know, that would also impair my recall. Um, so both memory and recall are impaired when you're depressed. What we know about the neurobiology of depression helps to explain these symptoms and why we can't just snap out of it. As we have access to different ways of assessing changes in the brain, we understand more and more about the neurobiology of mood disorders. Our research has clearly shown that there is an important neurochemical component to this illness. This knowledge has been advanced by brain imaging studies, showing the levels and location of several neurochemicals such as serotonin believed to be important in mood disorders. If you take an average depressed patient and compare them to an average healthy volunteer, what you see is that there's decreased serotonin transporter in the midbrain and also in the amygdala. Seeing these chemical differences helps some people accept that depression is a real biological illness that needs medical treatment. It's really difficult for people who have always had such incredible mental horsepower that they could think themselves out of any situation, that they could really resolve any problem on their own, that if they're struggling and having a hard time with depression, with anxiety, that if they continue working hard and doing what they've always done, they'll survive. I was so desperate to just fix this. I finally said, okay, I will go. And that's when I found out that um, I had general anxiety disorder and major depression. And it was, you know, it was hard to take because there's always this sense of, you know, um, that's never me, that's never going to be me. But it was. Blanca was referred to a psychiatrist and began medication. She also did a brief course of talk therapy with a psychologist. She comes back periodically to check in with him. Glad you can make it in. It's been a while. All accredited medical schools must provide their students with effective services. Many schools also cover the costs of the services provided. I would look at my schedule and it was already so full that I realized that Often, however, students' fears outweigh their desire to get help. Many students worry about the issue of stigma. They also worry about taking the time for treatment. They worry about financial barriers and perhaps above all, 
they worry about the potential, the perceived potential for punitive consequences. If I seek treatment for depression, is it somehow going to end up in, in my medical school record? And will that make residencies less likely to be interested in my candidacy for graduate medical education? These are the barriers, and fortunately, that's beginning to change. It's not going to go in your academic file or in your dean's letter if you come to us and need some help. We, in fact, anticipate that and want to help you. Blanca had been on the verge of dropping out, but once her treatment plan started working, she was able to do well again. When spring quarter started, I, I had a strategy. I was on medication, I was getting psychotherapy, and so things started falling into place. Before, it was very difficult for me to focus. With the medication, I was able to focus. I had better sleep. I had more energy during the day. Overall, it was just a sense of well-being. I only really felt like I needed therapy for, I don't know, maybe seven months. And it was great. Every time I walked out of there, I felt like I had lifted some load off my shoulders, that my mind was clearing up. I'm hoping that I can just keep this particular strategy I have now going and working for me. You know, though, uh, it's not a magic bullet. Medical school doesn't change because now you're on medication. Your approach to it changes to some extent. Blanca joined the peer mentors because she wanted to reach out to other students who might need help. The group encourages students to seek professional treatment and to avoid self-destructive methods of coping. And I'm wondering if you're hoping to fold into this next year some more um, things for the students that would be just relaxing or fun, other than going to a bar and getting smashed. <laughs> we typically see uh, people trying to cope sometimes with anxiety, with depression, with other problems. Uh, with different recreational drugs or with alcohol, but some of those methods begin to generate their own set of problems that become more problematic than the original problem that they solved. Moreover, the combination of a mood disorder like depression and a substance abuse or dependence increases the risk for suicidal behavior. Uh, our ability to control uh, suicidal impulses, for example, is diminished if we're using alcohol. It might be a really good function of this group to help people calm their anxiety and reflect back that, yes, you know, I was accepted. I am in a, in a, in a very selective and selected group, and they have faith in me, and I can do it. I've seen many students who were tempted to drop out of medical school and give up their dreams of becoming physicians. We urge them to get treatment first because once you're out of an episode of depression, the world looks very different and you feel very different in terms of your place in the world. By intervening during medical school, we may enable students to make good life choices uh, about their careers as physicians. My initial experience with depression was when I was in medical school. When I did not do well on my first anatomy exam and went in to talk to the anatomy professor, he said, son, you're depressed. You better get over it if you want to be a doctor. You know? and, I mean, that was the attitude at that time. In my third year of medical school, when you go into the hospital, I, f I found that you could work hard. And the harder you worked, uh, the less time you had to be depressed. And it was rewarded. Just a little. I came into private practice here in Little Rock. This was 30 years ago. Our practice was primarily trauma. We were some of the early surgeons in town who did breast reconstruction after mastectomy and then gradually drifted towards cosmetic surgery. Though many people with depression experience decreased energy and sometimes find it hard to work, some people, like Bob, use overworking as a means of escape. I had two surgery schedules. I had a surgery schedule in the morning and then I saw a patient and then we had an evening surgery schedule. I'd operate routinely until 9 o'clock at night. I was driven. I was very successful. 
I had a, a great career, but that's all I had. I didn't have a life. You can rationalize that you're doing it for your patients, that you're being a great doctor, that you were just working harder and building your practice or, or whatever. But in retrospect, I was depressed. Can that be? I probably knew I needed to be treated for many years before I got treated. And I just couldn't bring myself to do it, primarily because of the stigma involved. Uh, associated with with being treated for any mental illness. How are you doing? I think you're okay. I think a lot of physicians, uh, especially surgeons, are hesitant about being treated. They're they're worried about um, what it will do to their reputation, whether it will affect their referral base, whether people will think they're nuts. Medicine is still extremely competitive. All physicians, not just surgeons, but all physicians are hesitant to do anything that would decrease their competitiveness, that, that would put them at, the, uh, at a disadvantage. It wasn't until Bob had a life-threatening experience that he got into treatment for his depression. I had a, uh, a high-speed bicycle accident that ended up being a, a life-threatening injury. I started really examining my life. Um, what am I doing? Almost all I At that point, Rick stepped in. About six years ago, Bob began seeing a psychiatrist named Dr. Rick Smith, who recommended a combination of medication and talk therapy. Bob still sees Rick every month. Do you think you were avoiding your depression? The first time I went into therapy, I was very apprehensive. I mean, I had pretty much spent my life putting one foot in front of the other, just working more, working harder. I mean, I was a surgeon, I, 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 I'm not especially touchy-feely, or, and I didn't know what to expect. Well, you know, when, when we first started talking years ago. My relationship with Rick Smith is close, but it could very easily be the relationship that you have with an accountant, an attorney. I mean, it's going in to talk to your attorney or your accountant or your banker can be a very personal experience. I mean, I think talking about my life savings is pretty personal. <laughs> Underneath this white breath, right breast well if you can call it that i don't know what to call it you know my initial concerns about being treated included my patients knowing or the community knowing that i was depressed and, and being treated for it i decided that that just didn't matter and as it turned out it didn't it didn't matter a bit i just hope that this antidepressant works as well for me as the other one did. I've been pretty fortunate. I've been able to stay on the same antidepressant for several years. I talk to my patients routinely about depression. Cosmetic patients uh, as well as, as reconstructive patients. I think that um, the, the days of depression being something we couldn't talk about, I hope are long gone. Get changed. If I had just been treated earlier, I think my whole life would have been different. It was just such a waste, such a waste of my time, my energy, uh, my life, you know? And the lives of the people around me who, who suffered along with me. Physicians, not unlike other human beings with mental illness, may delay seeking treatment until they reach a point of crisis where the suffering that they're living with simply becomes unbearable. Waiting for a crisis adds pressure to the inherently complex reality of one doctor treating another. The suicide of Dr. Ron Brown illustrates this issue with alarming clarity. I did not know the impact he had until after his death when the emails and the notes and the letters came of, of how he touched so many lives on different levels. It was really a lovely first night, and the rest became history. 
Over the years, we've built a good life together, and I thank her for being uh, my best friend and wife, lover, psychiatrist, and all rolled up into one. Ron was a visible and accessible member of their community whose identity was closely linked to his profession. We both have strong ties to black fraternities and sororities. He was a member of the Omega Psi Phi fraternity. He brought to the chapter his skills as a physician and he started a, the Omega Alive program, which is a wellness program for the members and the community. There were annual dances where we had fundraisers and luncheons, and he would participate in the health fairs around town. One thing about Ronnie, he was always available for the kids. Always. Scooter used to come up to talk to Ronnie, um, you know, when he wasn't feeling well or things were bothering him. You know, I always appreciated him for that. Yeah. You know, that he had somebody to go to. Right. You know? Yeah. I think... Um, Losing his dad at a young age, he certainly wanted to be there for his own kids, in which he was. It was a family history of depression. His father died of suicide at the age of 53. As an adult, he could talk about that. But as a child, he was told, you know, my dad died of a heart attack. He just didn't talk about it. When Ron himself experienced depression, he was open with his family and periodically sought treatment, but he still struggled internally with a sense of stigma. One of the reasons that uh, physicians don't get treatment for mood disorders like depression or bipolar disorder is that, not unlike the rest of society, we also struggle with issues of stigma. When Ron was 53, the same age that his father died, he became depressed again. But this time, he was at a crisis point when he reached out for help. We're at our home at Martha's Vineyard. It was a wonderful weekend, but he was down. And before we left to come back home, he says, I've got to go talk to someone. I have got to go um, to, I'm just feeling too suicidal. Ron and Muntaj went straight to their community mental health center when they returned that night. The intake person said, well, I've called the doctor on call, and I think your husband will be okay because um, he has appointment. He has an appointment with his doctor tomorrow, and uh, he feels that he can get through, you know, until then. The next day, Ron saw a doctor but was still not admitted. Muntaj believes that concern about him being recognized at the hospital where he'd been on staff may have influenced this decision. It's very important for a physician who's treating a fellow physician for mental illness to be aware of his or her own biases with respect to issues like mental illness and stigma. If it was an acute case of depression with the risk factors of suicide, then he should have been hospitalized for that. He probably at one point said, also, I don't need to be hospitalized. And why they didn't challenge him, why didn't they send him, you know, right across the street to the hospital, I don't know. Of course, we respect our colleague. We want the best for them. But it's important not to be too deferential because we may not ask the tough questions that we need to ask to really get a handle on what's going on or we may be, in a sense, less diligent in pursuing or recommending a particular plan of treatment because we know that that entails a certain burden in its own right. And as a result, um, our fellow physician may not get the quality of treatment that he or she desperately needs to get well and to prevent suicide. Wednesday morning, as I was leaving the house, the police came in, they said, Mrs. Brown, and, you know, it was, I knew. I just knew. Ron had taken his own life in his car before even making it out of the neighborhood. I think the medical profession in some way failed him. Failed him by having presented right at their doorstep a, a man who said, this is how I'm feeling, these are my symptoms. Help me.
we've lost a good man. We've lost a competent physician. We have lost a life that perhaps would still be with us had there been more openness and less focus on the stigma and the taboo of depression and bipolar and suicide. In retrospect now, it's, I mean, I see that stigma and lack of understanding about mental disorders have also influenced some professional policies. Being treated for depression does open you up to some problems with the licensing board. Physicians almost universally cite the fear of losing their license as a major barrier to getting treatment for mental disorders. They'd rather take a risk with their health than with their license. The licensing and credentialing of physicians is done primarily by the state's medical licensing board. At the beginning of their career, and when they move to a new state, physicians apply for a state license, and then in most states, they must renew regularly. The state medical board members, even though they are physicians, see their primary role in, in making certain that physicians entering the practice of medicine are fully qualified to practice safe and competent medicine, and secondly, that physicians who violate uh, the medical practice acts within each of the states or violate the standards of practice within those states have, have a process in which they are disciplined uh, by that board. State boards have for years been asking the question, have you been treated for mental or physical illness? I think more and more of the state boards are, are making a transition into asking the question, do you have a physical or mental condition that would impair your ability to practice safe and reliable medicine. In Arkansas, Dr. Rick Smith spearheaded a process to make this change on the state licensing application. We saw many physicians who were avoiding psychiatric treatment because they were afraid of what would happen at the medical board. To physicians, it looms very large when you start taking away, thinking about losing your ability to earn a living. It's not just your livelihood, often it's your whole identity is threatened. So anything that might interfere in any way with you being licensed is a major threat. In Arkansas, licensing for the state and credentialing for hospitals and health plans had been combined into one application process in an effort to reduce paperwork for doctors. So when this process was set up, our state medical board, through its uh, credentialing verification service, included a question or two questions about have you ever received psychiatric services. In our state, those answers are transmitted to all the hospitals where a physician practices and all the health plans. One of the major hospitals in town sent me a letter after I checked the box that said I'd been treated for depression and said, get a letter from Rick Smith saying that you're not a, a hazard to your patients. I had just been chief of surgery at this hospital for the past two years. Various state medical boards, the hospital boards, are all my colleagues and friends, and it was irritating, and it was none of their business, really. I mean, it's, it's a small town. There's the potential loss of, of uh, collegial esteem. There's a potential loss of referrals. Gee, is this person crazy? Is this person not up to it? Maybe we should not refer them. Maybe we should not uh, elect them to office in the hospital or whatever. The unintended consequence that happened here in Arkansas is that the physicians have decided not to seek formal treatment they've either gotten treatment from another doctor in the hallway or the doctor's lounge, or worse, they've treated themselves, or even worse, they have not received any treatment, and they've just tried to suffer through it. Then I guess it was about three or four years ago, we had a couple of physician suicides, and we felt like that, that we ought to see if we could get this changed. So we organized a coalition and petitioned the state medical board to change their questions the process took time, but ultimately the medical board changed the questions so that doctors who are not impaired by a physical or mental condition 
do not have to disclose their diagnoses. What Rick Smith has done with the licensing procedure, I think will, will make a major difference in physicians, some physicians stepping forward and getting treated. Dr. Alice Flaherty is one of those physicians who stepped forward and got treatment. I sometimes think that I was the only person in medical school who actually believed the lecturers when they said, there's no stigma attached to mental illness. Alice is a neurologist and specialist in movement disorders at Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston. She is also the author of several books, including one about her experience with bipolar illness. She is a great example of how much can be achieved when doctors are successfully treated. I had an interest in mood disorders, um, but I did not have a strong interest before I myself got one. You know, I, I so love hearing when you say that it felt like you were making it up because, as you know, I told you, that's how it, it felt also to me. And not too many. I had a twin pregnancy that ended very badly. Um, both my twins died in childbirth. It was at that point when I started having bipolar disorder. Bipolar disorder is more commonly known as manic depression. And um, the stereotype is um, people who are incredibly up and then incredibly down. We don't really know that clearly what's going on in the brain of people with bipolar disorder. We do know that there are huge brain changes in both the manic state and the depressed state compared to normal. And we also know that it's one of the clearest disorders that has a physiological basis and also a very strong genetic basis. So it had features of both depression and mania. That was not a problem, but he's so concerned about it. Alice trained here in neurology as a resident, and so I was involved in her training. The two of us would attend together so I could see firsthand how she dealt with patients. And she was outstanding. I certainly was aware of postpartum depression. She was clearly troubled by it. People were telling me at the time, oh, you're so depressed, you're so withdrawn. And I'd say, no, I'm, I'm just sad. Alice believed her depression was just grief and would pass. But then she began to experience mania. And the mania was like this extreme agitation that I felt, not running around, but I had so many ideas pressing in my head. The mania caused her to develop a condition called hypergraphia which results in a compulsive desire to write. But even then, she didn't think she needed treatment. What it felt like was I had all these important experiences and ideas and I had to write them down, partly because they felt like they were slipping away because my thoughts were getting more and more hard for me to keep a handle on. I knew that I was hypergraphic, but it felt good. It felt like I was doing work. I didn't feel any need to see a psychiatrist, and I only went because my chairman asked me to. Family, friends, and colleagues often notice symptoms of a mood disorder, but are hesitant to speak about it. Experts say that the best thing to do is encourage the person to seek professional help. In Alice's case, this was the key to her recovery. Well, I can tell you that she's not the only person in my department who has gotten depressed or had other psychiatric issues. And I convinced her that if she doesn't get help, that that would be, you know, something that would then affect her performance. And if she did get help, it will not impact on her career and that I personally would be, you know, supportive of her because here she was this incredibly talented person who was, uh, you know, not being her normal self and she didn't recognize it. The psychiatrist that I saw was wonderfully able to be a reality check for me. I ended up getting both talk therapy and pretty significant medication therapy with her for about six years. Um, and I have to say that the, in a way, Oh, the talk therapy didn't really help the primary diagnosis, my depression, my mood problems, but it very much helped me be, be able to deal with them. Want to think in it made it possible for me to learn tricks to calm myself down or wake myself up or whatever I needed to do. Uh, and it also got me interested in psychiatry, actually. She was so willing to talk about why she was doing things. Um, I found that incredibly valuable as an educational experience. I'm going to be talking generally in this talk about the folk definition of psychosomatic and the folk definition of illness. 
Alice's experiences inspired her to branch out from movement disorders into new areas of research around creativity and the brain. She also began learning more about the intersection of neurology and psychiatry. Feel free to ask questions, because otherwise I'll just start talking faster and faster and faster, and I'll start adding, going off on all these tangents. So when I first started noticing that my brain was going squiffy, obviously the huge scientist area in my brain kicked in, and part of me was terrified and part of me was just so fascinated, like, what's up with this? And I started reading about it. The more I read, you know, the less I knew. And it just came into my head like a mission. I had to write this book. In the 19th century, hysteria was actually seen as tied to creativity. This is something um, and people have studied, and it turns out creative people actually are more hysterical. Um, Alice's book, called The Midnight Disease, combined personal memoir, medical case studies, and reflections on the lives of famous writers, all written through the lens of neurology. The book is about what in the brain makes people have the drive to write, because many people, what's much more likely is that they have, hy uh, not hypographia, but writer's block. So I got interested in why would someone have writer's block? What could you do to get out of it? The book was very successful, and she has become the go-to expert on the topic giving lectures, and making television appearances. I've now got this, like, career as a minor, very minor media person that's willing to talk about creativity. My theory is that it's because I'm the only neurologist in the world that tells jokes on TV. So I guess I will um, first check just to see what settings you're on now. Another outcome of Alice's experiences was a desire to bring her expertise to the treatment of depression. I see people with deep brain stimulators, and that includes both people with movement disorders like Parkinson's and also now people with depression. Currently, she is involved in a clinical trial of the use of deep brain stimulators in patients with treatment-resistant depression. So it's, um, I have you down at 7 volts and then 90 microseconds. And in deep brain stimulation, you have a surgically implanted, very thin electrode that just stays in your brain and the tip ends in a part of the brain that we know is important for depression. When the electrode is turned on, that area of the brain changes in its activity, and that changes your mood. Do you mean like it's really a, like a warmth, like a blood rush? Yeah, it's like a blood rush. It's like you can feel it sort of permeate your... Bliss was somebody who had been very high functioning and was just walloped with a just incredibly severe depression and it had just been unremitting to any kind of drug treatment, everything that you could imagine. So she was, in many ways, a perfect person to be our first candidate. And it's, so it is frustrating, because there's all these other things that can affect your mood, including worrying about the stimulator, so. I feel like I can pick it up and use it for a few times, and then I forget. It's such a cliche where, say in the movies, the doctor gets an illness and then becomes a better doctor. And I was really, annoyed that this cliche thing happened to me. I think it did make me a better doctor. For one thing, I'm way more sensitive in picking up the mood of my patients. And I also know a little bit how terrifying it can be uh, to be on the other side, to feel that your doctor isn't taking you seriously as a person. I am also interested, just, you know, when, how you feel when people ask you how you are, you know, because I can see that as being sort of an imposition you have to She's pretty extraordinary. She's very different and she's very real, but she um, she's made me feel okay about things. And I think that does go a long way in terms of helping patients. And I think it's important. I wanted to ask you about this uh, case. It's a deep brain stimulator referral, but it was really an unusual one because it's a 17-year-old boy. Yeah. And it's for tremor. Yeah, so he's got to really be afraid, I think, of this, what it is. Though Alice has achieved a lot since she got her diagnosis, she still has to manage her symptoms and treatment, like anyone else with a chronic illness. A lot of what's different now for me is actually cognitive. I waste a lot of energy just kind of trying to keep my thoughts in order. The other thing that's hugely different for me is that my moods are more up and down still. Is there anything that you want Even though I'm on medication and, in fact, feel that I'm at the best set of medicines that I've ever been on, I still have to keep track of these things. I used to be kind of intolerant with young people who come in with really minor tremors. So I'd be thinking of all the people with the really bad tremors, and I'd be thinking, you know, young man, this is simply, you know, cosmetic. But then when I got a tremor for one of my psych meds, 
and it's just so tiring. She has been functionally very intact in terms of patient care and the things that we expect of her at work. She's written books, she uh, teaches, she's a great doctor. Um, she has the capability of moving up through the academic system and, and being a real star. And you would have lost a wonderful physician and uh, caretaker for people who are really ill also and need help. The potential loss of a great physician like Alice reminds us what's at stake when physicians with mental disorders stay in hiding. Wonderful physicians end up spending their lives depressed or committing suicide because of their reluctance to, to get help from each other. And I think, that, I think that's a tragedy. The good news is that we can prevent a lot of physician suicide simply by earlier recognition and appropriate treatment of the mood disorders that lead to suicide. Now that my depression has been treated for a while. What we're trying to do is to tell physicians that treatment works, uh, that treatment's effective, that uh, you uh, can have a better quality of life and perform better as a professional uh, if you go ahead and get treatment. And when mood disorders are treated, physicians are able to focus on what gives their lives meaning. A large part of it is my work, and a large part of it is my family. Several years ago, Alice gave birth to healthy twin girls. She worked with her doctor to manage her treatment throughout her pregnancy, delivery, and postpartum period to assure her own well-being, as well as that of her children. To be with my kids now, my kids who are alive and healthy, it's just so wonderful. The pleasure is actually probably more intense now than it used to be, uh, partly because I feel like I seized it back from the grave, like it could have been so different. For Bob, one outcome of his treatment is that he's pursuing a long-term goal to work in hospice care, helping dying patients. I've enjoyed my 30 years in plastic and reconstructive surgery, uh, but I've, I've had an interest in hospice for a long time. So are you going to work two more months in your office? Yeah. I'm leaving a practice that is self-sustaining. There's no night call nicest patients in the world but I'm, I'm going after something that I've always wanted. Depression is in every culture, it is in every race, every economic group but when treated properly the person with the disorder can live a normal life, can go on to do amazing things it starts here and it continues out into the, the professional world. And there is hope that the next generation of physicians will not only get treatment sooner, but bring their awareness of mental illness to their practice of medicine. I will be able to reach out to my patients in a way that's much more genuine. Since I've been through something that, that worked, I can help people um, understand what they're going through and to cope with it. These physicians and families give insight into the personal and professional challenges faced by physicians with depression. But their stories also give us hope that effective treatment exists and can not only improve, but save the lives of these essential members of society.